Reading with your kids. Hola, ni hao, konnichiwa, assalamu alaikum, shalom, jambo, bienvenidos. Hi, my name is Jed Lee and this is the Reading with Your Kids podcast. We are coming to you from the beautiful neighborhood of Reedville in the southwest corner of Boston, Massachusetts. Please connect with us on social media, facebook.com slash reading with your kids, at Jed Lee Magic on Twitter, at reading with your kids on Instagram. Our guest today is Josh Ship. He is here to talk to us about no matter what, a foster care tale. I'm really excited to share this interview with Josh Ship with you. His his book, No Matter What, is a real honest version of his experience as a foster child. And I think it's really important for us to understand what kids in foster care are going through. There are over 400,000 kids each day in the foster care system. And that's why I'm so excited that Josh is here. Hey, you know, I'm also excited to let you know about my educational magic show and about the fact that we have transformed the show to be totally interactive and totally fun via Zoom. You know, schools, they adjust if they're opening, they're just not opening the way they did in the past. There's this hybrid stuff and schools that are going live, you know, the kids have to stay apart and wear masks and there's no big gatherings and so school assemblies, they're just not happening. But we can still motivate your kids to be respectful. We can encourage them to read through wonderful interactive magic. And, and, and through my show, We Will Roar, Respect Others and Read. You can find out about it by going to my website, wewillroar.com. Joining us on the line right now from the San Francisco area of the great state of California. He's here to talk about no matter what, a foster care tale. Please welcome to the show, Josh Ship. Josh, how are you? Howdy, Jed. Looking forward to our conversation today. I'm really looking forward to it, too. I was sharing with Josh, Josh that we've had uh, a number of guests on the podcast talking about um, uh, foster care and foster families and your story is going to be a little bit different. Tell us, tell us a, a, a about no matter what a foster care tale and some of your story. Sure, I'll begin with the context of my story. Uh, statistically, I should be dead, in jail, or homeless. Uh, statistically, growing up as a foster kid, those are sort of the odds that are placed before you. I was abandoned by my mother as a infant. I then entered the foster care system as a kid, and as soon as I was probably five years old, I developed this massive chip on my shoulder. You see, I've realized what kids don't talk out, they will act out. And growing up as a kid in foster care, I felt, even though I couldn't articulate it as a five-year-old, I felt hurt, I felt abandoned, I felt afraid, and anger is fear that is unvoiced. And so I just sort of constantly acted out against these different foster parents, the different adults who lovingly and caringly came into my life. In their face, I saw the face of the, of the adult who abandoned me, of the adult who I was supposed to trust. And so because of that, between the time I was born up until 14 years old, I intentionally got myself kicked out of 12 different foster homes. I would literally keep a notebook with quantitative statistical analysis like it was a game to see how quickly and how efficiently I could get myself kicked out of these different foster homes. Now, at 14 years old, I end up in my my social worker's van, and we are headed to yet another foster home. And I assume this will be home number 13 that I get kicked out of. But these foster parents, the Wiedemeyers uh, from Yukon, Oklahoma, though they had no special ability, no special training, no magical powers, these two loving foster parents completely and totally changed the game for me. And the reason that they changed the game, they changed my life, the reason that I am not that st- And it's that mentality is why I titled the book No Matter What, because these foster parents, that was their underlining mentality. 
that we are not giving up on you no matter what. We love you no matter what. We are not turning our back on you no matter what, regardless of what you do, of how hard you push, of how angry you are in the inside, uh, not because of what we did as your foster parents, but because of what was done to you prior to getting dropped on our doorstep at 14 years old, that no matter what, that all of the abuse I had received, the physical abuse, the sexual abuse, the mistakes, the getting suspended from school, the the experimenting with drugs and alcohol, the going to jail, the being suicidal, all of these horrific things that had been done to me and that I had foolishly chosen to do myself, no matter what, we love you, this is your home, and we are your forever family. This was their mentality. This was their heart, and it's why I call the book No Matter What, is because I believe every foster parent can give that no matter what gift to a foster kid, and every foster kid like me desperately needs a family, a parent, a caring adult to say, no matter what, I believe in you. I, now, I'm asking this question because that statement, that no matter what statement, is something that I've had to share with somebody in my life a number of times. How many times did you have to hear that before you were able to accept it in your heart? Uh, well, I mean, the ratio is far off because... <laughs> You know, the time that I really heard it was I had entered the Wiedemeyer's house at 14 years old. I went to jail because I wrote some hot checks as a teenager at 17 and a half years old. They allowed me to stay the night in jail. They could have bailed me out that night. I think sometimes a loving thing to do as parents, I'm a parent myself, is to uh, not cause our kids pain, obviously, but allow them to sit in the pain that they themselves have caused mm. so that as cognitive research shows that they you know, really embrace the lesson that that foolish mistake uh, is presenting and offering. You know, when they brought me home from jail, they, they yet again – said, hey, look, no matter what, you know, we don't approve of what you did. We don't agree with what you did. There will be consequences to what you did. But, Josh, you need to get it through your thick head. No matter what, we love you. We believe in you. We do not see you as a problem. We see you as an opportunity. Uh, you know, I circled back to my foster parents as an adult because we still have a great relationship. They are who I consider to be my mom and dad. And I asked them, I was like, hey, uh, you know, we were – we were having just a meal and laughing about all the just absurd, silly, terrible things I did to them when I was growing up in their home. I said, hey, I'm just curious, because uh, I'm a parent now, how many times do you think you had to say no matter what to me? How many times do you think you said that? And they just, <laughs> man, I don't know, like a 100? <laughs> uh, honest to goodness, when I was 17 and a half, after they bailed me out, that was when I took it to heart. That was the first time that I really, really heard it. And, you know, I believe that the effectiveness of a message has very little to do with the messenger. It has to do with the receptivity and the timing with the audience. It is because in that moment that I had experienced pain because I was willing to begin to accept some personal responsibility for my behavior as a 17-year-old. You know, no kid should get left. No kid should be abused. All of that is obviously terrible. But this stuff I was doing at 17, this was my fault. This mm -hmm. was not my biological parents' fault. This was not the foster care system's fault. This was not anyone who'd hurt me's fault. This was this was my fault. And so, you know, by by being in that situation – it really opened my heart, and it opened a window of influence for me to really take that message, no matter what, to heart. What was it about this family that made gave them the the, the courage and the power to say to you, no matter what? You 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 were bounced. At, I think you said thirteen different foster homes by the time you you landed with this family. 
what is it about them? What was it, it about their makeup that that gave them that that love to be able to say to you, Josh, no matter what, this is it. This is your last forever home. It is something that fascinates me. Like, how on earth did you just not want to, you know, just like tase me or get rid of me or, you know, just I must have driven you absolutely batty. Uh, you know, there are 690,000 kids in the foster care system uh, in the U.S. right now, and and I was one of them. And even though I was one of 690,000 foster kids, I felt completely and totally alone. And you know, now as an adult, I have studied this. You know, what is it about these foster parents? What is it about the power of one caring adult? And I did my postgraduate studies at Harvard University, and I was not a part of this. Harvard in March 2015 did a study, the National Scientific Council on the Developing Child, and they found that for any kid going through and experiencing adversity, and obviously any foster kid would fit into that definition, uh, that the common denominator that they found between a kid becoming a statistic versus their own version of a success story, however you would define that, is, is that kid having, and I quote, one stable and committed relationship with a supportive adult. One stable and committed relationship with a supportive adult. So to circle back to your question, what was it about these sets of foster parents that made the difference? How were they able to have the courage and to endure? And it's really that they were able to be stable, to, you know, in the children's book, I illustrate my foster parents as elephants. I am a squirrel in the book no matter what. Uh, I share sort of a, you know, age-appropriate version of my story for younger kids. I'm a squirrel because I'm doing all this squirrely behavior. I'm, you know, moving in with the, you know, with with the kangaroo family and doing these sorts of things and, you know, a, a gerbil family and doing these sorts of things to push them away. But my foster parents are represented and illustrated by elephants because elephants are not only patient but immovable. And this is what my real-life foster parents were. They were immovable. Now, why? What is the practical application that any foster parent or that any caring adult listen can take and apply to their own life? And it is that this. My foster parents did not define their success or failure as foster parents or as parents based on my behavior, based on my approval of them, or based on how I was reacting. Again, what kids don't talk about, they will act out. And so when I was pushing back, when I was acting out, when I was saying mean or hurtful things or doing mean or hurtful things or just doing foolish things, of course, as a parent, you have to step in. Of course, as a parent, there have to be consequences. But they did not own what did not belong to them. They did not own that behavior. They, they knew and understood, look, this kid is hurting. This kid has been through some things. This behavior isn't about us. This is not about us. This is a kid who is hurting. This is a kid who is spiraling out of control. And, and so what do we do? Uh, really two things, consistent encouragement and consistent consequences. And the key word is not encouragement. The key word is not consequences. The key word is and, both. Like mm. those elephants that I illustrate in the book, no matter what, we need to be an immovable, loving, tough, tough and tender source and stability in this kid's life. Uh, that is what they gave to me, and that, I believe, was their magic touch. And, you know, the things that you're saying are, uh, Obviously, they're Im important and hopefully will ignite uh, another family's heart to open up their home to a, a, a foster kid who needs that forever home. But I think a lot of the lessons that, that you're sharing about your foster family are, are lessons that every family needs. We all, as parents, need to be consistent and firm and loving and immovable and letting our kids know that 
no matter what, <laughs> you're you're ours, and um, yep. and, and 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 also, you know the, what what you said about not owning. Uh, you know, there's a my, my my son went through a very difficult three years in middle school, and mm. it was really difficult. Not, <laughs> you know, and when we you know finally found out what was going on at school that was causing him so much pain, it was really important for us to, you know, to be supportive of him, but also not to own that, that the pain that he was bringing into the house, how, understanding, hey, he, he, it's, it's not us. He's hurting. Exactly. And we need to let him get through this. Yeah. And let's, I mean, the reason why it's important not to own that is, it, is it's a question of your own endurance as a parent. You know, there's a difference between taking responsibility and trying to own something that is not yours. I mean, as a parent or as a caring adult in a kid's life, whether the kid is a foster kid or not, whether you're their parent or grandparent or aunt or uncle, uh, you can certainly take responsibility for helping them, but you shouldn't take ownership of things that is really the kid's challenge or issue or problem to own and to work through. And there's two reasons for that. Number one, if you take ownership, uh, you know, the research shows that you are subtly and psychologically saying to the kid, well, I have to own this because you are not capable of owning it yourself. You are not strong enough to own this yourself. So therefore, I have to come in and rescue you. And then, you know, cognitive research would show that that can unintentionally sort of develop this mindset that, hey, I can't solve problems on my own. I have to wait or hope or pray that someone's going to swoop in and solve them for me. And secondly goes to, as I alluded to, the idea of endurance, which is this. Look, I'm a parent myself. It is awesome and it is agonizing. It is, is without question a marathon and you need endurance. I mean, of course we know we need to be uh, you know, consistently encouraging and consistently consistent and have consequences and these sorts of things. Uh, but we are incapable. I am incapable of doing that if I do not have the endurance which it requires. And so, therefore, if we take ownership for things that, that really don't belong to us, then then we get worn down. And research shows that as parents, when we're worn down and then our kids – act out or do something, depending on your personality type and proclivity, you will either flip in or flip out. Uh, flip in means you just sort of bury your head in the sand. You don't do anything, which exacerbates the problem because you go, look, I'm worn down. I got my own issues. Uh, you know, I got stuff at work. I got drama with this situation. I just can't handle another thing. Now, look, as a parent, that's an understandable situation to be in, but it has unintended second and third tier consequences. And then if your personality is more like mine, uh, you might flip out, which is, you know, a, a situation sort of buttresses up against you. Uh, you might flip out. You might overpunish, overreact. Then you have to circle back and now sort of look behind you at the wake of damage you've unintentionally done. And so by not owning things that we should not own, but rather pushing responsibility on the kid, coming alongside them, uh, getting them to own it, and then instead of doing it for them, being that patient, loving coach, that loving guide, that, that that elephant in their life that is an immovable, loving, consistent source of encouragement, we transfer that responsibility to them, which really builds esteem because mm -hmm. self-esteem, as someone once said, I believe it was Dr. James Lehman, that, that self-esteem is not given. Self-esteem is earned through esteemable acts. When we teach our kids, whether they're three or five or seven or 17, look, you can do hard things. You can face hard things. I will be here alongside you, but you're picking up the pencil. You're picking up the shovel. You're going to the neighbor and apologizing. Oh, and by the way, you're also going to pay for their broken window. You can do hard things. That inculcates and builds their esteem because it is earned, not given. Such a powerful lesson. And, uh, boy, I 
remember going to the neighbor and apologizing for breaking his window and paying for it. <laughs> I didn't mean to call you out like oh, that. Oh, no, no, it's okay. My dad was right behind me. and But it was, it was you know, it, it happened almost 100 years ago, and it's a very vivid memory. <laughs> it's not something I think, it's not something I've thought about for a long time, but the minute you said that, it came right back to me, and it really was a turning point in my life. Uh, and you know, how would I have grown differently had my dad just said, ah, forget about it, you didn't get caught, you know, um, or had paid for it himself, you know. Uh, it was a, a powerful lesson. I'm, you, you have so much to say to, to parents, to, uh, to uh, foster parents. What inspired you to write this book? For kids, and and what kids were you writing it for? Yeah, for me, as I mentioned, 690,000 estimated kids in the foster care system. And growing up as one of them, uh, it's just mind-boggling to me. I literally thought I was the only foster kid on planet Earth. And so because of that, I was ashamed of it. I was terrified that when I would enter a new foster home and enter a new school, that some teacher or some peer, fellow classmate, would find out that I was a foster kid and that then I would get labeled as, as a loser, as a leper, as someone to be avoided, as someone who's broken, as someone who's unlovable. And I, I, I mean, I cannot overemphasize how alone I felt. Mm-hmm. And, you know, now my team and I, uh, we host events for parents, educators, caring adults. We have curriculum in over a 1,000 schools across the nation. We host over uh, 800 events each year in K-12 to schools and foster care organizations and agencies. And I see this same thing with foster parents is that they, you know, they are so – First off, 99.9% of foster parents are amazing, selfless, incredible human beings. The 0.01% that gets covered in the media is not representative of your typical foster parent. But I see foster parents feeling that same sense of aloneness in the struggles that they're having with their foster kid. And they take it personal, and they think it's about them, and they feel like they're doing a bad job, and they feel like secretly, we would never say this out loud, they're thinking, maybe this kid would have been better off without me. Am I just making her life worse? And so for me, that's what inspired me to write this book, is I want both foster kids and foster parents to have a age-appropriate tool that they can use to have these important conversations. And look, the book will make you laugh. It'll make you cry. It ends in a sweet, delightful way, just as my life has because of the Wiedemars. I believe that every kid is one caring adult away from being a success story. And I believe every foster parent can be that one caring adult. My foster parents certainly were for me. In this book, no matter what, a foster care tale will communicate to the foster kid in your life or that you know that they are not alone, that they are not broken, that they are not unlovable, and that they too, like I did with the Wiedemeyers, illustrated as an elephant in this book, have that one caring adult or that one set of caring adults that they can turn to, that they can open up to, and that they can trust. I I, I love that. I and I and I think it's it's genius because I think there's a lot of a lot of foster families out there who don't know intuitively that at some point it's so important just to say, as the Wiedemeyer said to you, um, "This is it. We're your forever home. We're not going to give up on you." What can a what can a family a, a typical family and a kid who's not in foster care get from reading, no matter what? Well, I mean, look, regardless of whether or not you're in foster care or a foster parent, 
The book is silly. The book is funny. The book is heartwarming. The book will provide perspective as to why any kid, when they go through something challenging, whether it's uh, you know, being in foster care or just the challenges that your typical kid faces with issues of identity and who am I and I get made fun of for this quirky thing about me, uh, that when kids go through these challenges, uh, they often act out. And again, as I said at the top of our conversation, anger is fear unvoiced. And so I think uh, even a kid or a parent that isn't in foster care, they're going to see this play out in the character Josh the squirrel with the squirrely behavior, and they're going to see what happens when that kid opens up, acknowledges what's happening, and turns to an adult in their life and opens up to them and begins to get hope and healing for those challenges. Well, this is wonderful. I'm really delighted that you've written this book. And I know that my friends over at Familius have, you know, they've, this is not their first book on the subject of foster care that they published. Uh, they, they, they have a commitment. I, I have to tell you, Josh, between you and I, it pisses me off. And I, I don't think I've ever used that expression on this podcast. It pisses me off that there's close to 700,000 kids in the foster care system. It really mm. angers me that so many of them have your experience when they're where they're bounced from home to home to home. It angers me that most of those kids, when they're moving from one home to another, have to take their entire life's possessions mm -hmm. with them in a green or white plastic garbage bag. I it, it and it angers me that that we as a society don't stand up and understand that those six hundred ninety thousand kids are our kids, and we have a responsibility. Not everybody can be a foster family, a foster mom, foster dad, but there are so many different ways that we can support foster kids. Dr. John Garmo has has you know pointed out some of them in, on, on this podcast is. Lots of ways that we can support foster families and 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 foster kids, and it's it's not a nice thing we should do. It's the moral thing that we need to do because yeah. these are our kids. Absolutely. Before you go, where can we connect with you online to find out more? Because it sounds like you have these great things going on. How can we learn about that and get involved in it? Yep, my website is Josh Ship. That is Ship with two P's dot com. Or if you're not in front of your computer, you can just text my first name Josh to the number six six eight six six, and I'll make sure to send you some resources. I'll share a link to my TED Talk, which is uh, appropriate for adults, but sort of goes more into my journey with Rodney and Christine Wiedemeyer and how you can be that one caring adult to a kid in your life. Just one last question. I love adults. Uh, excuse me. I, <laughs> I love it. Not all adults, but now I, I love elephants, and I think they're really cool. But were the Re Wiedemeyers a little bit upset that they were portrayed at, 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 as elephants initially? Oh, interesting question. Not at all, actually, because <laughs> my mom, my foster mother's favorite animal in the entire world is an elephant. All right. That's cool. So they're all about it. We've had a really wonderful time speaking to the author of No Matter What, A Foster Care Tale, a great new children's book from our friends at Familius, and the author is Josh Ship. Josh, thanks so much for being part of our show. Thank you, sir. Please be sure to join us for the next episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. Our guest will be Matthew Cordell. He is the author of Hello Neighbor, a picture book biography of Mr. Rogers. That's the next episode of the show. I want to thank the folks who made today's show so very wonderful. Of course, we want to thank our guest, Josh Ship. Be sure to check out No Matter What. I also want to thank my team, starting with my incredible producer, Fatima Khan, my awesome author, Ambassador Peggy Cotto, my amazing daughter, Alejandra. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all the support she gives me, but most of all, I want to thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today, and as always, thank you so very much for taking the time to make the world a better place by reading with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next edition of the Reading With Your Kids podcast.